welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, The Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to The Jet Setter Show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. I think you'll enjoy the interview we have for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds here on The Jet Setter Show. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn how to finance your next big real estate deal, there's a show for that. If you want to learn more about food storage and the best way to keep those onions from smelling up everything else, there's a show for that. If you honestly want to know more about business ethics, there's a show for that. And if you just want to get away from it all and need to know something about world travel, there's even a show for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from JasonHartman.com or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. My pleasure to welcome back to the show Robert Landori, and we are going to talk today about his newest work, and in that, talk about how terrorism has impacted and will continue to impact international travel. Robert, how are you today? I'm very, very well and very happy to be on your show. You called me the mild-mannered accountant. (laughs) Everybody was surprised, especially my friends. I'm not known as being a mild-mannered person. Uh On the contrary. (laughs) Well, I will say, neither am I. (laughs) Neither am I. But But I hope you're not an accountant. (laughs) No, not an accountant. Definitely not. But hey, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show. Terrorism, you know, whether whether one believes the threat is real or not, you know, which I think is up for debate, frankly, I don't know how you feel about that, but definitely has impacted and made travel such a hassle nowadays. I agree with you 100%. What are your thoughts? The lineups for security checks are becoming absolutely, absolutely impossible. The strip searches, the the rude TSA people. Absolutely. But you know what you what I have noticed? It's interesting. Although I've been traveling a lot lately, I had never saw Osama bin Laden lining up. So who won? <laughs> Good point. Well, you know, it's um, it's something that I have to experience every time when they ask they ask me to take my belt off. I was always I'm always afraid my pants will fall down, but it's a hassle. And international travel and international terrorism go hand in hand. Just out of curiosity, uh, with that question you last posed to me, do you believe the terrorist threat is real, or at least to the extent our government would have you believe here in the U.S.? Terrorist threat is very real. All you have to do is look at what's going on in the Middle East and the not-so-Middle East. And you know that even in Russia, which is a country that is fairly well controlled, there is terrorism. Terrorism is an easy way of having a way when you cannot have your way in a democratic way. And unfortunately, we in the West suffer from the fact that we only like democratic ways of doing things. And the terrorists, of course, don't like that at all. They love to come here. They love to come to the United States of America and Canada and live here. But then they try to destroy what we have constructed, which is really not very fair. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, is there any, do you have any tips on how one can deal with this better? Well, of course, travel less, but that doesn't make any sense because people are curious and people want to see the world. The answer, I guess, is travel light. Don't take things like bulky stuff with you. Be aware of the fact that you're going to go through a screening. Plan your itinerary to try to avoid those centers that are really difficult and hassle full, such as, for example, Heathrow Airport in London. It's a disaster. Well, I shouldn't say a disaster. It's a, it's a nightmare when it comes to security if you have a very tight connection. There are other airports that are extremely efficient and very easy to go through. 
like for example Venice just to give you an idea Venice Budapest uh, it's amazing how you get all get through Budapest very quickly Vienna uh, these are places you know where you can connect from much more easily than when you're going out in New York. I think that New York is very hassle-full. Oh, sure it is, of course. Well, New York is sort of the epicenter for it. What is your new book about? Tell us more. Well, my new book is basically the sequel to the first book that I published, which was called Fatal Greed. Uh, in that particular book, uh, two guys were manufacturing uh, surgical glue that was made out of bovine blood. They miscooked the batch. They affected it with new variety, Kreutzfeldt Jacobs disease, which is uh, the, the mad cow disease is the human variety. And uh, the, this glue gets out, begins to kill people, and uh, the fellows who have made the mistake disappear. The glue is an orphan, and the terrorists get a, a hold of the inventory, and they are now wanting to use it as a as a weapon of mass destruction, but they can't because there's no vaccine against it. There's absolutely no cure for it because it's invariably fatal, at least the variety that I have manufactured in my brain. And uh, in my new book, there's a man by the name of Jason Moscovich, a Canadian scientist who's trying to find a vaccine against this particularly dangerous variety of Kreutzfeldt Jacobs disease or Mad Cow disease. So the terrorists kidnap him, and they try to get him to get that disease, in, uh, I'm sorry, that, get that vaccine into their, their hands. In other words, before the, the Westerners get it. But he, he doesn't cooperate. He's having a hassle. Obviously, he's not very enthusiastic about working with the terrorists, but they keep him on a, on a very, very short leash, and they kidnap his mother as well. That's what the book is all about. And I ain't going to tell you no more about it because nobody's going to read it. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> of course. Was your second book Havana Harvest then? Yes, it was indeed. Havana Harvest was, uh, as you know, was a semi-true story. And I got to know about what happened with uh, Fidel and his merry men at the, at the time when I had a very direct contact in Cuba uh, who used to be Raul Castro, who at the present time is the president, Raul Castro's secretary, who brought me a, brought me a book of uh, actually a transcript of a trial of a general that finally met his death at the hands of the execution squad that Dr. Castro and his brother arranged for. Him. That was Havana Harvest. That was a good book. Uh, I sent a copy of it to Fidel. He wrote back to me. <laughs> oh, how interesting. Just out of curiosity with Cuba, I've been there once and I found it to be a fascinating place. What is your outlook for that country? I mean, you know, there was some talk before uh, Obama got in office that Cuba would really, he, he would start opening it up, lift the embargoes and, you know, it, it would just become a whole different place. But you see some of these dictatorships and pseudo dictatorships, boy, they're they're holding strong, you know, whether it be Belarus right. or North Korea. They're, nothing's, nothing's loosening up over in those, those parts. But Burma has opened up, I heard. That's I have right. Heard. Yes, Burma. Yeah, and just it's a recently. wonderful country to visit. It's very interesting. And I'll tell you, Cuba is a wonderful country to visit. Oh, sure. Cuba's because great. The, the, yeah. Cuban, the Cuban people are very nice. And, the, and at the present time, there are facilities for tourists that have not existed before. These uh, casas particulares, in other words, these private homes that are allowed to cater to tourists. It's a family home where you, ca you get a bedroom and you give you, they give you breakfast and they give you guidance. And it's very, very pleasant. Canadians are very fortunate in that they can tr freely travel between Canada and Cuba. Uh, and uh, we have, as Canadians, been traveling in large numbers to the beaches, like Cayo Coco, uh, to uh, Varadero, and all these other places. And in fact, you know, uh, the food is cheap. It is not particularly good, I must admit. But uh, the beaches are beautiful. And for people who want to have an interesting and different uh, experience, 
I believe that United States citizens are now allowed to travel to Cuba. Is that not so? I am not sure. When I went there, it was maybe eight, ten years ago, and we got a special clearance from the State Department to leave right out of Miami in a chartered jet. But that was for a project that was, you know, with Young Entrepreneurs Organization, and we didn't have to worry about going to Mexico or anything like that, like a lot of Americans do. That's right. But now I understand that you can get clearance from the State Department quite easily, as long as there's some educational meaning to your, your trip. And of course, every trip is an educational trip. I know that your listeners would be interested in, in listening to this because uh, it's worth worth going to Cuba. It's It's completely different from anything else. And it's, you know, only 90 miles. It's like I going, it's uh, that 90 miles from Florida, though, is like going back in time to the 1950s when everything sort of stopped there. <laughs> you know? Oh, you're, you're absolutely right. The 1959, actually, is when it stopped. Yeah, right. 1959, when Dr. Castro took over, he came, uh, well, the revolution triumphed when uh, uh, Batista left the country on New Year's Eve of 1958. Well, you see all those American cars from the 50s that are being held together with bubble gum and duct tape. And, oh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's like nothing has changed. It's, but but the interest, another interesting thing about it, that it just really shows you how communism just doesn't work. It, it's so anathema to everything in the human spirit. But, you know, you, you see put these... That, you know, you put that very well. You, you know, it's thank anathema you. Yeah. to the human spirit. Yeah. Absolutely spot on. It's the reason big government doesn't work, because when it's everybody's money, it's nobody's money and nobody cares. People just exactly. stop caring. That's why uh, private property rights will always be the best way to ensure progress and to uh, ensure a better environment. And it's not perfect, but it's just better than everything else. <laughs> so, but, uh, you're right, yeah. you know, and, and the tragedy of all of this is that the Cuban people who were very diligent and very industrious and, as you can see, very successful in business because, after all, the Cubans who live in Miami are making money and are very valuable members of society. But the Cubans who live in uh, Castrolandia, as I call it, the worker's paradise, are forced to be into chicanery and theft in order to make a living. Because, you know, uh, the, the wage is $25 a month. It's terrible. I mean, and doctors earn about the same as uh, not much more than everybody else. So what's That's the right. incentive to excel and, you know, be better and try harder? There's just That's no right. incentive. Yeah, no question about it. Oh, what I was going to say about it is that you see these gorgeous buildings with just beautiful, inspiring architecture in Havana. And then right next to one of them, you see some gray concrete, square, right. communist-era, Soviet-era building with, with no concept of architecture or inspiration or any creativity whatsoever. And, you know, it's just so obvious that that, that that system is just a failed system in every possible way. But, you know, what is your outlook? Are, are things going to change in Cuba? Is it going to really become part of the world community at any point in the near future? Well, look, I can tell you, you know, uh, mayhem on the Daniel takes place, for example, in Budapest, Hungary. That used to be a com communist country. When the Soviet Union collapsed as such, uh, there was a transitional period, and all of a sudden we now have a democracy, albeit imperfect, but a democracy where private enterprise is actually made Budapest into a beautiful, beautiful city. The same thing is going to ha happen in Cuba. I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to compare the two countries, albeit there was a lot of similarity between the two, but when both of them belonged in, to the socialist camp. But sooner or later, the Castro brothers' uh, rule, put it in, in that context, is going to end. Fidel is nine years older than me. I'm 77. He's, uh, I'm 78. Oh, that was, I was 77 when you first interviewed me. <laughs> and, and so Fidel is uh, 86, 87. Raul is two, three, no, six years younger. But he's also very ill. So these two guys are not going to last forever. They've lasted a long time. And you've noticed that Fidel doesn't talk too much in public. But he still puts his nose into everything. As soon as these guys go, 
the Cubans who live in Miami will try to reclaim what they've lost. And they go back and they transform the Cuba that we now know into a mixture of what they're going to make of it and what there is there now. Now, what this will look like, nobody knows. But I know that in Hungary, it worked. In, in Hungary, the, uh, the communists actually pretended that they were paying people, and the people were pretending that they were working. <laughs> the same thing is, is happening in Cuba. And 20, no, 20, nothing, 50-odd years of this kind of regime infects two generations. So the Cubans will have to retrain. You know that in, in Miami, there is a, there, in a, the University of Miami, there is a department that does nothing else but Cuban and Cuban-American studies. And they watch very carefully what's happening there. And uh, not even they know which way it'll go. So it's Syrgis is as good as mine. Well, your outlook on the travel hassle issue with the, the terrorist threat and TSA and so forth, you know, I heard a thing on the news just last week, actually, that TSA's goal by 2017 is to make it so you can just walk right through security a, and walk yeah, on the plane. A tunnel. Yeah, a tunnel. Right. Yeah. So this, this tunnel will probably pump radiation through our bodies and, you know, invade a, our privacy and look at every square inch of what's under our clothing, I assume. That's right, but I don't think it'll be harmful. I, you know, it's, uh, it won't be like x-rays. I don't think there'll be uh, radiation that will be harmful. This, you know, science is a wonderful thing in the hands of the right people. And they will come up, especially in free enterprise countries, with a solution. And therefore, I see that travel is going to get bigger and better and, uh, and far more interesting because it'll be easier. What is going to happen with regard to body searches? Of course, they're going to pull people aside and look at things. And there's going to be profiling. And, you know, hopefully one of these days, and, you know, I lecture on money laundering and terrorism, one of these days everybody will have the political will to choke off the money supply to the terrorists. And once that's done, finito, there won't be that many terrorists. Look at what happened in England to England in, in the, you know, the IRA and all that thing. Last week, the queen shook hands with the, the fella who killed her cousin. So things, things, are, things are getting better. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a good outlook. Talk to us for a moment, if you would, about Burma. So you've been there, Myanmar? I've never, no, no, I've never been to Myanmar. Okay. But you were saying it's a wonderful place to travel. I, I, um, I'm, I'm curious to go there. I can't believe how quickly it has opened up. I mean, I really cannot believe it. It is amazing how fast that's happened. Well, I went to Thailand, right? And I went to Singapore. And I went to Malaysia. And I had a peak. I'm not supposed to say this, but I had a peak at uh, Burma, Myanmar. It was very restricted, my peak. Uh, but it's a beautiful country and a beautiful people. And uh, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, is one of my heroes. What about North Korea? Will that ever open up? Oh, I mean, oh my wow. God. What, a, what oh an outcast my country. Oh, God, man. That is something else. I don't know. I just don't know how people can weep and cry. Did you see how they, they adore their leader? I mean, it's total brainwashing. Total brainwashing. And I don't know what, I'm sure that it's an interesting country. I've never been, South Korea is interesting. North Korea must be interesting too. But now they have all kinds of difficulties, economic, food, not a country that I would like to visit. I hear about 300 outsiders get in there every year and you have to sign an affidavit saying you'll never say anything bad about them. I don't know how they can control that once you go, but... It's just a scary place. I would. I'm, I, I have a morbid curiosity with it. I look at it on Google Maps, and I love looking at the satellite images. And by the way, you know, with the new Retina display on the iPad, wow, you can really oh, you, see yeah. clarity on that. It is amazing. It is. Don't really, tell me you've got the sickness. It it is amazing. You know, I mean, but I'm it is a sickness fascinated. that iPad. Yeah. Well. <laughs> You know what you can get from it? What's that? Tennis elbow. Tennis elbow. Now, I don't use it that much. I use my MacBook Pro more. But If you take the iPad to bed with you, as some people do, so they have it to hand in the morning. They have it in their hand. Oh, no. That's coffee, not me. Coffee, 
<laughs> not you. But coffee in one hand, iPad in the other. It's always the right hand that holds the iPad. You get tennis elbow. Not me, not me, not me. <laughs> well, well, good. Well, Robert, give out your website and tell people where they can get the book or you know anything else you want them to know about the book. Well, first of all, my website is www, otherwise known as the World Wide Weight, dot robertlandori.com. Number two, you can get my book in both the electronic form as well as in the soft cover form from all major booksellers, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. By the way, Amazon.ca, Amazon.com, Amazon UK, wherever you look. And the notebook, uh, which is the, the Barnes & Noble one, there it has it in both varieties, to use that word, electronic and regular. The book is a very topical story because it shows how easy and vulnerable the West is with regard to an accident that can quickly become a weapon against it. And so the West has to be very careful, and uh, terrorism has to be choked off. The money supply has to be choked off. If we don't do that, we are going to be in trouble. And naturally, travel is going to become complicated, even more so than now. Hopefully, though, people reading books like mine, like Mayhem on the Daniel, uh, Fatal Greed, and also Havana Harvest, will keep on wanting to go to these places and uh, looking at what the world is really like and how beautiful it can be. And it will help them open up as well. I think that's one of the contributing factors in, in every country that sort of opens up, even in China. You know, a friend of mine told me how he would go there in the 80s and, of course, how different it was, but you could see it starting to open up. You could see people listening to westernized music and how that just is a, is a progression that, that uh, well, almost always occurs. It's the young. It's the young people who do this, just the, like the Arab Spring. I mean, look at how far uh, the Middle Eastern people, uh, I should say North Africa, and uh, the Middle East has gone in trying to democratize itself. It, it isn't easy. Look at Egypt, for example, uh, an amazing place. Have you ever been? I'm sure yes, you have. I've been to Egypt, one of my 64 countries I've been to. And I'm not so sure, though, with the election having just happened and the Muslim Brotherhood, I'm not so sure Egypt really has opened up. Well, but, interestingly uh, we'll, we'll enough, have to see. Yeah, we'll have to see. The army is really the controlling factor in Egypt. And the army is, you know, the army is the army. The army is the army everywhere. Uh, we live in a very good country. Canada is a great country. The United States, uh, the North American continent is a good place to live. And, of course, I always tout Quebec because it's French and it's very cosmopolitan in Montreal. We've got to come and visit. We've got to come and visit. No, Is that where you're located? I can't remember. I live, in Mont I, live in, I live in Montreal. Oh, yeah, yeah. A friend of mine is up there now. He lives between there and Mexico. So I was thinking of going up to visit him. Maybe I'll come visit you, too. I haven't well, had time I, to plan a trip, but that would be fun. If you came up, I made, I'd make sure that you'd be very welcome. All right. Well, thank I you so much. That's a lot of things. Well, good. Robert Landori, thank you so much for joining us again on the show today. And keep writing those international thrillers. And I, I, I just love your work. So keep it up, okay? I will indeed, and I hope you'll have me back. I, I will. I'm going to have another book ready, I would say by October, but not if in October. It will be in March for sure, because it's about 90% done. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Robert Landori. Thank you. Now's your opportunity to get the Financial Freedom Report. The Financial Freedom Report provides financial self-defense in uncertain times, and it's your source for innovative, forward-thinking investment property strategies and advice. Get your newsletter subscription today. You get a digital download and even more. Go to jasonhartman.com to get yours today. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. 
Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc. exclusively.